Hello and welcome to this Shakespeare Teachers Conversation on teaching anti-racism through Shakespeare. It's great to have so many of you with us from all over the world. Um, I'm Jill Woods and in normal times I run this seminar series at Birkbeck University of London as part of the Centre for Medieval and Early Modern Worlds. So the idea behind these uh, Shakespeare Teachers Conversations is to create a space where teachers from all different sectors can speak to one another, share ideas and resources and collaborate. This feels like a very important moment to engage with one another. The murder of George Floyd has highlighted the ongoing trauma of racist violence and its long history, as well as the damage still being done by racist structures, not only in the US, but also here in the UK and in other parts of the world. We also know that the pandemic is exacerbating existing social inequalities, so that the challenges many students face when trying to access education have become even more acute in recent months. Teachers in schools, universities and other sectors are having to be very imaginative and proactive in finding ways of helping their students negotiate this moment at the same time that those teachers are also having to deal with its impact in their own lives. So this is a, a really important moment for us to share and collaborate where we can. Today's speakers, Ayanna Thompson and Laura Turchi, who I will introduce properly in just a moment, are truly exemplary in this regard. Their book, Teaching Shakespeare with Purpose, A Student-Centred Approach, is a fantastically generous work uh, and an incredibly motivating read. It works through all of the different elements of teaching, from course, work, uh, from, sorry, from course design to classroom activities to assessment, and shows how crucial it is to develop purposeful frames that empower students as critical thinkers. So this book is really just essential reading for anyone who teaches Shakespeare. Um, but one of the um, many important things it does very brilliantly is it shows how to address questions of identity and race with students in practical ways and shows why, it, why it's crucial that we do so. So Ayanna and Laura have very generously agreed to talk more about that in today's session. Just before I hand things over, uh, I'll explain very briefly how this platform works. You'll have noticed that we're in Zoom webinar mode uh, today, so that means that we would like our attendees to con uh, contribute through the Q&A function that you'll find at the bottom of your screen. We're asking you to type your questions there rather than using the kind of raise hand uh, function, just because the technology works a bit more smoothly if we're not attempting to switch on different people's cameras at various points. So please do type your questions in uh, during the talk so that they'll be ready for Ayanna and Laura to address um, after their presentation, after their conversation. Um, and both of our speakers today have agreed um, that you are very welcome to live tweet this session using the hashtag shake race. Uh, but that's more than enough from me. Um, I know uh, from the excitement expressed in the booking emails that our speakers don't actually really need an introduction, but it's such a thrill for me to get to do so. <laughs> so, um, Professor Ayanna Thompson is Director of the Arizona Centre for Medieval and Renaissance Studies at Arizona State University. She is a world-leading Shakespeare expert whose work focuses on race and on performance. Um, I'm sorry, but I don't have time to list all of her numerous books, uh, but they include most recently Passing Strange, Shakespeare, Race and Contemporary America and Shakespeare in the Theatre, Peter Sellers. In addition, she wrote the new introduction for the revised Arden Three Othello and is currently collaborating with Curtis Perry on the new edition of Titus Andronicus. She also founded Race Before Race, an ongoing conference series and professional network community by and for scholars of colour working on issues of race in pre-modern literature, history and culture. Laura Turchi is Assistant Professor in the Department of Curriculum and Instruction at the University of Houston. She is an expert in a variety of teaching practices ranging across traditional, hybrid and online platforms, something which many of us no doubt find very enviable <laughs> at the moment. Um, in addition to Teaching Shakespeare with Purpose, co-authored with Ayanna Thompson of course, uh, she has published on a range of ped pedagogical topics, often with a focus on Shakespeare in journals such as Ubiquity and the English Journal, as well as numerous essay collections. She's the co-founder of the Teaching Shakespeare in Houston project and co-edits a Teaching Shakespeare column for the English Journal. So I will now hand over to them. Thanks so much, Jill. Thank you um, very much. It's such a pleasure to, to be here. I'm sorry we can't see you all 
but I get to talk to my favorite person on the planet to think about teaching Shakespeare, Laura Turchi. So um, the pleasure is really mine. <laughs> Oh, and thanks, Ayana, and thank you very much, Jillian. I um, I think it's kind of perfect that we've figured out this as a as a conversation. Um, the the not particular secret is that um, our book was written in a conversation. We sat next to each other and then did variations on this to try to figure out what we really meant. And I I love to have this opportunity to expand it and to return return to some of the stuff that seemed important then, but seems is critical now in all the all the ways that our world is uh, challenging uh, right now. So um, I want to start um, talking through some aspects of the work uh, in terms of who our students are, and we'll uh, just as in uh, that chapter and some other work we've done, we'll kind of go away away from Shakespeare, and then we'll come back. I promise uh, uh, we'll come back to Shakespeare. Um, and, and also make sure that we're having a conversation that feels relevant to the, the teachers that um, we're excited to be um, trying to engage with in this case, because uh, classroom work is so important and it's so complicated right now uh, in the world we're living in. Um, so our book uh, and our chapter, especially on, on uh, identity and embodiment, uh, largely focuses on millennials uh, who were the, the students we cared we continue to care about, but students we were really caring about at the time we were writing. And um, there are new kids in town, right? Uh, Gen Z has, has begun to be a powerful force uh, in how we're thinking about where our society is. And so um, I wanted to think today, or have us think today a little bit about um, Gen Z as learners, and as learners of Shakespeare, ultimately, um, and who they are. So technically or as we think about generations right now gen z is born 1995 to 2010 roughly but what's interesting is that the generational theory of the way knowledge transmits from generation to generation is kind of falling apart and technology is part of that and also uh, our expanding lives and our expanding working lives uh, um, uh, lengthening working lives so there's some evidence right now that if we look at the generations as we're understanding them. Um, there are five generations of people kind of working side by side right now, and that's making changes in who's mentoring who, because the youngest people, the Gen Zers, may need to show folks how to use Twitter, Zoom, all these other tools that are so important. And so we have, um, we have a real change in the idea of who whose knowledge is supposed to be passing on to whom, and that's impacting the Gen Z students um, in, and our society. Um, another thing that, of course, is, seems so obvious uh, and yet is so important is what hyperconnectivity is doing to ideas about learning and um, really about ideas about what we value. And um, hyperconnectivity, especially looking at Gen Zers right now, is as much about influence uh, uh, means that influence matters maybe more than affluence. If you want to change the world, your influence and your ability to have an impact, uh, your ideas to have an impact through whatever platform you're using from TikTok to wherever else you are, is, um, is more important and literally more valuable uh, than um, particularly having affluence and sort of not knowing what to do with it as a lover. Um, the current US uh, interesting uh, events going on around Goya beans uh, and Goya as a product is an interesting one. Uh, there's pretty good evidence Goya is not really worried about a boycott, but they're very worried about reputation and association. So again, influence uh, as opposed to um, affluence. But um, for Gen Zers especially now, our, our newest learners, if you will, um, Gen Zers are also in this unprecedented amount of, of, of information and connectivity and influences. The self is what you experiment on. The self is where you test and change and determine, well, who am I and how do I look to the world? What is this image of myself? Who is, what do I believe in? Where do I stand? And um, the Gen Zers are very interested in defending causes related to identity, which we're going to talk about um, today some. Um, they're more, it appears to be more interested than previous generations in human rights. 
in matters of race and ethnicity and in uh, all the different ways that people identify themselves um, because that's um, how Gen Zers are recognizing their own place in the world and therefore recognizing others in the world. So we, we initially wrote um, Teaching Shakespeare with Purpose thinking about what we called the advanced learners and that age group still makes sense, not children who are still being exposed to Shakespeare, but also students who might for the first time be thinking seriously about um, Shakespeare and, and learning, learning about the place in some depth. Um, but we're just trying to recognize that those advanced learners are now a different generation or are increasingly a, a different generation and worth thinking about it. And then we have this spring, uh, which feels like the eternal spring now of, uh, of 2020. Um, and uh, it's very clear Gen Zers are going to have this bifurcated experience in their lives that is the difference uh, pre and post pandemic. And of course, we're not post pandemic yet. Uh, just like we were never post-racial, we are certainly not post-pandemic. And so we are still in the middle of understanding what it's going to have meant to have closed down society, to have had the kind of economic disruption, to have the fear of connection and travel that was all part of what made kind of millennial life cool uh, and that, is, that we're losing now and for the foreseeable future. So one thing that is very interesting to me, um, and it, it's interesting, uh, Jill, you were saying about the, the, the possibility of the, the silver lining or whatever that we can meet. I can have this conversation with Ayana, we can have this talk back and forth um, so easily with Zoom, right? Get the, you know, get the lighting right and get the screen set up and suddenly you are, um, you are connected and you're not, jet lagged or otherwise traveling. And the challenge is I, there's not very good evidence that that kind of engaging cross timelines, cross country uh, conversations are what our students are experiencing in school. Um, they don't think of Zoom as an exciting chance to talk to people they might not have otherwise got to meet, right? That's not a place for rich dialogue or ongoing coll collaboration. For many students right now, Zoom is where you are, you know, kind of planted in front of to hear what the teacher wants you to do. And that's, um, that's hard. Good teachers are working hard to do better than that. But nonetheless, the student experience of connectivity in the name of school is, is really limited uh, and is not the rich webinar experience that some of the rest of us have had. And then the other question that this, the bifurcation of the pandemic is also going to cause is also this huge social, important social uprising that we're experiencing um, that is maybe going to move students from seeing activism as retweeting or liking or signing petitions online to activism as standing up, getting out there, maybe still socially distancing and wearing a mask, but nonetheless being a physical presence to say what matters, what's right, what's wrong, et cetera. Um, and, um, and it's interesting, uh, despite the fact that students are no longer working in schools, they're no longer in their classrooms, that one of the places of social activism amongst um, high school students in the US anyway right now is the renaming of schools. Right, and to students who say, you know, no, maybe they, maybe they haven't physically stood in this building for whatever it's been now, four, five, six months, but they still don't want to be associated with the name that's on the, that's on the, um, on the marquee if it's a Confederate uh, general or other person. There's a, um, the famous school that, is that was from a movie called Remember the Titans, which is about desegregation and on a football team, big deal here in Texas, et cetera. Um, they, uh, they, that school is working to be renamed because it's named after a segregationist. And, um, and it's really, uh, it's, students are talking about the pain of being associated with a name that I think previous generations may not have paid any attention to. Like, who is that? That's just the name of the school. That's just what it is, not something worth interrogating. So these are big, these are big things. Um, but uh, the last thing I want to say about Gen Z's, especially as we, we move into this further, is that um, there's pretty strong evidence that students are having a very good lesson in all the important learning that happens 
outside of school. All the ways that what learning, the learning that matters to them is less and less something that's defined by what happens in a classroom. That was already where we were going, I think, because of, um, because of just the power of the internet and all the connectivity options. And um, uh, James G's work on, on uh, teaching and learning and literacy uh, is really powerful to talk about other kinds of learning and learning where students find affinity groups, find other places and ways to learn outside of school. But the problem is then what is the purpose of school? Like why, you know, if it's named after someone you're embarrassed by and it's a building you can't go into because it's dangerous now and the world is much more interesting outside than, you know, what is, what is the school and what is the role of the teacher at that point? So these are, these are um, challenging times for all of us who care about teaching and, and teaching teacher education uh, and just straight on what is the value of the building. And there is a counter pressure also coming from the same people who recognize some of these dynamics to emphasize um, youth education that happens outside of school in different uh, what gets called youth work different after school programs different uh, opportunities that are usually thought of as extracurricular or supplemental but it turns out they mean a lot to students uh, and we've always known that but now in these times the loss of those community-based learning opportunities is also a powerful challenge to to what what our students value and what they um, what they've come to learn um, one great affinity group uh, again pre-pandemic but again kind of to this purpose and i'll speak more about uh, kind of restoring and digital tools and counter storing um, in a bit i think but um, this is a, a video called romeo is bleeding it's a documentary of an after school fine arts group uh, poetry group who end up doing a uh, engaging in an after as in this after school program in writing their version of Romeo and Juliet, claiming it for their own, not to focus on the romance, but to try to speak to uh, gun violence in their home in Richmond, California. So powerful political statement using available um, media of different kinds, but also definitely saying the meaning of who we are is not in the classroom, it's in the words we have a chance to capture and say in this, in this format instead. So there are, um, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of implications for this in teaching Shakespeare. And again, understanding the point of time we're in and understanding the social dynamics. And uh, we've got many things we can talk about, Ayana. One thing I thought we could especially think about is we say pretty um, blithely and repeatedly in our book about the importance of independent facility with complex text. And suddenly independence is super important because so if students aren't self-directed, then they're very much foundering in this world of online education. Um, if they're not finding opportunities of, of one way or another to learn. Um, the, More or less, uh, friend. Yeah. The, <laughs> Sorry, okay. go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, no, I was just going to, I wanted to, um, or I didn't want to cut you off, but I wanted no, to didn't. kind of, um, kind of reemphasize one of the points that you're making that this generation is learning in incredibly different ways. And so if we're not attentive to this in the way that we teach Shakespeare, Shakespeare will probably disappear from the curriculum. And I don't say this blithely because I think that if we're tearing down statues in Liverpool and all across the US, Shakespeare is potentially one of the kind of cultural statues that could come down. And I'm not sure there's a lot of fight, at least in the US, to keep Shakespeare in the curriculum. It is probably different in the UK. But if we don't have a way to talk to our students and to make the learning of Shakespeare coincide with the learning of truth, which they think occurs outside of school, then it's done. It is ap actually done. And I think that the way that we were approaching millennial learners, remember we wrote the book in 2014, so that's six years ago. And again, like so much has changed in those six years, not least of which the students who are now in that 16 to 18 year old range being in a different generation. Those students, and I have two Gen Zers, uh, my children, 
And I see that they do not think that school is the place where they get the truth or where they get knowledge. So we I think some of the things that we emphasized in teaching Shakespeare with purpose about bringing identity into discussions about Shakespeare, about emphasizing Shakespeare as a complex text that you can have a lifelong relationship with that isn't always about the teacher giving you the answer, which in a lot of um, educational systems, that is how Shakespeare's taught, but as opposed to, as in a different way as posing all of the questions that you keep circling back to in your life. I think then if we don't do that, then it, we're in dangerous times for Shakespeare education. And so I just wanted to hammer that point. No, no, it's, it's exactly right because that's the self-directed learning thing, right? It has to matter to you and it has to be something you want to pursue. And the foundation for that uh, uh, might be beginning in a classroom, but it also may be coming from some far other place. And, and so a teacher has to, under, has to think about like, what, who are you? What are you bringing to this class? And why should this space of our classroom, physical or virtual matter? right to you how can it matter to you and precisely it's, this is hard. and if we're not talking about race ability and gender and sexuality status all in fluid terms the students will just shut it out as something that is not useful and not truthful and i do think that shakespeare does allow us to talk about race gender sexuality and ability in very truthful ways we just have to have teachers who are willing to have that be part of the frame of the discussion. Because again, if it's not, the students will just say, it is not something that is relevant to my life. And what is relevant to my life is what I learn on YouTube. Right. Literally, I, what yeah. I learn on YouTube. <laughs> right. And we, we are in such a, we're in such a complex place about that because, yeah, so one of, one of the other things I think I shared with you was, um, you know, that, um, there's this sense that Gen Z has a kind of, it's called like a specific brand relationship to YouTube. And you'll, people mention it all the time. And um, it, I mean, my generation, people have mentioned it all the time. Like, well, he just looked it up on YouTube and figured out how to do it. You know, this kind of fast way that younger people are able to, to get to answers and get to self-help videos of various kinds. And that is absolutely uh, what, uh, younger people have mentored me to do, right? I mean, it, that is absolutely the, the reverse learning or whatever, like, oh, it is right there. It's that easy. But that's looking for, you know, how to make toast, how to, how to do this, how to do things. That's not how to critically engage with a difficult text, right? And that's Though sometimes it is, general. though. I mean, I think that's where some of our yeah. educate, I mean, where we should be intervening because yes. actually we could have our students making YouTube videos about how to read, perform, analyze Shakespeare in this 21st century moment, right? Because Absolutely. I do know that like, so I have a younger end of Gen Z and an older end of Gen Z and the older end of Gen Z child I have looks at um, political commentators on YouTube all the time. So his kind of analysis and his kind of progressive analysis of politics comes from, and he calls them YouTubers. So like, <laughs> like not his teacher. And in fact, we were talking about redlining in the US, which is about a uh, history of African-Americans not being allowed to buy homes in certain areas or to get home loans for houses in certain areas. And I was like, wow, you know, I was never taught this in school. And he looked at me, he goes, of course not. They don't teach you anything important in school. That is, that is really, I know, I know, right? I know. Like, <laughs> yeah. So I mean, should we circle specifically to Shakespeare more, Laura, now? Well, yeah, I, I, but the only, the thing that's, that is so hard about that, though, is that, I mean, you've got a kid that you're paying attention to, what he's watching, how he's engaging, you're engaging with him about what it is. But that's not a, that's certainly not a universal experience of, of adolescence. And, um, and the, you know, G's point, Jim G's point about affinity spaces um, goes back to, you know, John Dewey, which is experience can teach you a lot. It can teach you to do very bad things successfully, right? And so we have to, we, when we think about a role for a teacher in these times, it has to be about, yes, it's assigning 
it's sharing truth, it's assigning great projects, but it's an attitude towards this, this is what we do in this classroom. This is the business of our classroom is yes. to do this kind yes. of work. Yes, yes. And I don't think, at least from my children's teachers so far, I don't think that they've gotten that message, right? Yeah. That, that the, 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 the signing to the students should be what we do here is about real life. Right. And about your particular, your life in particular, and your identity, and the way you're navigating that identity. I don't and think not that. just preparation for, say, a test, but also not preparation for, you know, oh, someday when you're in college, when you get to read real things or whatever, yeah. right? It's a uh, yes, yes, yeah. There's a theory about that in curriculum. That I I can't remember where it starts, but it's this idea that you know we think of curriculum as as we don't say this, but it's like we have to lie to children up to a point because then we can let them discover the truth. And I think in these days and with this time, lying to children is ineffective. Uh, as a, and also probably bad pedagogy. Yeah. Yeah. And I think if, if, if you, if any of us start a Shakespeare unit, say you, you're starting September 1st or whatever, October 1st, whenever you're starting in the fall with, with your students. And if you start a Shakespeare unit that does not actually engage with everything that's been happening in the world recently, they will never return to Shakespeare again. Right. Because they will think of Shakespeare as something that is 400 years old and does not speak to the current moment. And not, so, not authentic to, and to not authentic, anything yes. of, of their, in their lives. Yeah. I think um, the, uh, the necessity of, of building a safe space to do that and show, um, show students what matters is, of course, something we wrote about a lot. And I think we, everybody is very conscious of right now what is what is safe what is non-triggering what is uh, open to open to debate what are the spaces yeah yeah and i think so just one point that i we uh, we make in an article that's not out yet but <laughs> feels slightly dated because it's it's taken six years for this article to get published <laughs> literally six years but <laughs> But one of the things that we point out in this article is that not talking about race or approaching race in a colorblind fashion will be triggering to the students, will be triggering. It is not a neutral stance not to talk about race. It that is, is the, one of the most important things I think of this summer or this year is the, that there is, no, there is no neutral stance, right? And, yeah. and the students will immediately smell the falsehood if a teacher talks A, about universalism and Shakespeare, or B, kind of just skates through and not talking about race. They will be out. It will be inauthentic and something that is not relevant to their lives and something that they will never want to return to. Right. Okay. So with that background, because we feel like you have to like lay out like think really critically about who your students are at this particular moment. And as Laura said so brilliantly and clearly, like the, the generations are kind of changing faster than they did in the past because of, for various reasons, but primarily technology. So what would a good um, employment of, of all of this knowledge about your students and the current moment look like, especially if you're talking about, um, if you're using performance-based techniques. And of course, performance-based techniques are gonna look very different depending on whether you're in person or doing some sort of like synchronous, asynchronous online education. So um, we were talking about one of the ways to, if you're, say you're having a unit on Romeo and Juliet, and uh, one of the opening questions in the unit I think should be, like what kind of performances have the students already been exposed to? Like, what have you seen? What did it look like to you? And you can leave it open like that. And if they talk about race, which I assume they will, um, but maybe they won't depending on how comfortable the, the room feels, but you can ask leading questions that gets them to like, what, what, did, what was the comp, you know, composition of the cast? So kind of what have you been exposed to and then turn to uh, thinking about like what's happened with the statues in your country being torn down. 
and then ask, is Shakespeare a statue? So we sort of kind of looked through this a little bit briefly um, a few minutes ago. But if I think if you start a unit of Shakespeare with those as some of your guiding questions, the students will realize that, that Shakespeare is a part of what's happening around them and that they get to have an opinion about what we should do with Shakespeare. And then you can lead them to how should our Shakespeare performance or analysis, how should race come into play with that, right? Who gets to read the part of Juliet? Do we want anyone? Like, does it matter if it's a recent African immigrant who is reading the lines of Juliet? What happens when we get to the lines when Romeo talks about Juliet's beauty being super white that, you know, it, it's like seeing crows on snow, right? Like, the, or diamonds in an Ethiop's ear. Um, those kind of racialized metaphors that Shakespeare employs and Romeo employs, what happens then in that moment if, we've, if you're acknowledging the room, the bodies in the room? Laura, you look like you wanted to say something. Oh, no, I would I'm be just, happy to have. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I think that's exactly right. I mean, one of the, one of the things that um, folks um, have been struggling with, of course, with the online embodied experience when the room is no longer the room, but it's this screen full of faces or whatever is, um, how, can we, how can we have participation even assessed by the teacher that is about what have you, what have you done to enhance or contribute to the community that is our community here? What, what can you do to, to make our classroom community something better than it was when it started? And helping students name where they are with a play or a speech or a language or it's, you know, you know it's like I get the words, but here's what the words are to me, I think is part of the, that, that sense of, of, of embodying something that uh, might feel off of, um, you know, like the prescribed way to, you know, the purpose that you think you're moving in, but it might better represent the purpose to which the students are really, uh, uh, hung or the purpose for which they're hungering, which is to talk about who, who they are and, and who they might be as students still, right? What they might become. Um, yeah. And that, and that it is fluid, right? Like I, I always say to my classes, right? Like you all collectively may decide something at the beginning of the semester. And then <laughs> let's hope that, you know, we've all moved by the end of the semester. And so, you know, I, I like to take timeouts to say, okay, some of the things that we decide collectively early on. So and many students, at least in college classrooms are, are, and who knows, maybe now with the bifurcated world we're in, this won't be true anymore, but they'll say, we, we want, really want to see Shakespeare done the way it was intended. That's where they start the semester. Where they end the semester is completely different. And I like to say, that's learning. Like, movement is okay. That's not you being inconsistent. And also, someone saying something that may be offensive at the beginning of the semester and then moving his or her thinking throughout the semester is okay, too. I do like to say in my classes at least that there are gonna be times when we all say things that offend somebody else. And this is the, precisely the place where you should do it because this is the place where we're meant to learn together and that the collective learning is much more powerful, right? Like you, people move faster collectively. Um, and I think the challenge of course, um, for many in the US and I'm not sure where things are in the UK is that we're gonna to have to do that probably through screens. And um, I, again, I think Laura, as you said, may, many educators are experiencing rich content through webinars and Zoominars and Zoom webinars and whatever, but that's not how students feel about it. So we need to get them to a place where it feels like, oh, my learning in Shakespeare in the Zoom setting is as important as what I'm learning on YouTube or is related to what I'm learning on YouTube. Well, and, and also the embodied, the embodied experience isn't, isn't possibly going to be as rich a discussion, I think, as rich a discussion on Zoom as it might have to be in a discussion board or in some other, you know, whether it's a Flipgrid series of videos that students are making or whatever, the, you, the, the physical time next to each other, talking to each other that is gone right now means that we have to expand all of these literacies to give people a chance to talk and express and to say 
here's where this was, and that that becomes as relevant. I think um, the relevant, sorry, to the overall classroom. When I when I was saying that about participation, I mean that's something I'm really struggling with with my my students. Discussion board is often very performative. You know, here I am showing you that I read the work. Da, 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 very dull, very accurate, maybe maybe even insightful, but but it's performed for me. And so to think about how discussions, how um, moving from, okay, we were able to be together for this hour to talk about this. Now, what can you give us in writing or in through a video or through whatever that can expand that, that can, that can help to, to move it forward. And it, it, you know, it's challenging also as a teacher because then the boundaries of the classroom are so, are so fluid, right? It's, it's uh, you know, and we as professionals want to think of ourselves as, you know, kind of learning 24 seven, but students aren't used to that. Students, at least in my experience, high school students especially are very much focused on, okay, you do English from 10 to 1130 or whatever, you know, whatever the block of time is, and then it's not relevant anymore. And we have this new cause to say, no, 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 <laughs> you're always learning. You're going to see all these things in all of these places. And we have to, we have to make that matter to our work together, yeah. our, our, our classroom work. So I realized we, Jill, we've been talking straight for about 40 minutes or so. Do, do you want to, or should we, in, should we do questions now or <laughs> do you want us to keep going? Oh, you're still <laughs> muted. My. <laughs> Sorry, I managed to unmute myself and mute myself simultaneously. Yeah, um, I'm happy for you to keep going if you had um, more things you want to talk about or we also have questions uh, here. So do you feel like you're, you're ready to start taking on questions? Sure. We, yeah, yeah, answers also. We would accept answers too. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah. others should supply answers. <laughs> First of all, can I just say thank you because that's such a fascinating discussion and I thought it's really brilliant how um, you're thinking so specifically about the students that we're working with and, and sort of showing how important that is. Um, and I mean, just the idea of sort of asking students, is Shakespeare a statue is just such a wonderful starting point um, for people that are, uh, teaching at the moment. So thank you for that. Um, we have, um, we've already got some questions. I would encourage people to, to add some more. I'm going to start with, um, someone's asked a really kind of important question about terminology and it's just a simple question could you please define what you mean by universalism uh, so i'm aware that people are, yeah have different <laughs> yes right. yes i'm sorry i should have uh, <laughs> i should have not used that so quickly um so when i use universalism it's the way that i was taught which was that shakespeare um is timeless shakespeare speaks to all human conditions at all times and um, regardless of who you are, Shakespeare is good for you. And I very think- spinach. <laughs> Very spinach. Yeah, it's very much spinach, right? And I think student, of course, I was being taught Shakespeare at the birth of like kind of post-colonial movement and the movement of like kind of African-American studies. And so I smelled the lie in that immediately, but I couldn't quite articulate why. But I think it's become very clear now that like all of the racism, the sexism, the homophobia, the classism, the ableism in the plays makes it so that you have, the students are gonna be like, this isn't about everyone at all times, no. I mean, it's very much about the 17th century, but that doesn't mean that we need to throw it out. These are really, really complex texts. And if you can master that, you know, kind of, Anal reading, understanding, analyzing, challenging those complex texts, that's a skill that's transferable to anything. So I think, you know, we, we talk about Shakespeare being the vehicle as opposed to the destination. It's not like you need to get on a bus to get to universal Shakespeare land. Actually, what you need to do is use Shakespeare as a vehicle to understand other complex texts. Thank you. That's such a beautiful explanation of universalism as well. Um, so we, we have another question. Uh, someone said, as an elementary school teacher who brings Shakespeare into my classroom, my students often have no past experiences with or assumptions about Shakespeare in performance or otherwise. What suggestions do you have about introdu introducing Shakespeare for the first time through an anti-racist lens? Um, so yeah, sort of suggested ideas here of diverse images of casting, making connections between plays, other conversations we're having in the classroom about race. 
Yeah, so I am so not an elementary school teacher. I, I really, I want to not claim, uh, I, I want to just express my envy that you've got teachers that want rich texts like those into schools. We, we're suffering under such a skills-based regime in the U.S. now and, and test prep regime that uh, literature is, a, is a, a not not very much at the center ever. Uh, it's sometimes, but I, I do think the, the question of casting, the question of who looks, who looks right or who looks whatever and where that comes from and letting that be a conversation and not a, not a determination by the teacher is a really important start. A really yeah, important start. And, and I do think that if the elementary students have not been exposed to Shakespeare, they have been exposed to like love stories or family feuds, like some of the kind of larger generic bits that you get in Shakespeare will be familiar to them. And I think asking questions about like, what does a lover look like? Uh, what does a beautiful woman look like? Begins to allow an anti-racist um, pedagogy to, to, to start and then using that into to Shakespeare. Yeah, I think the other thing that, um that I think is really powerful is um, the work, uh, well, a, a good friend of mine, um, Clayton Stromberger does at, at the Winedale Festival in Texas, and that's or through tech in, here in Texas, is, uh, is having kids do choral readings and other ways that kind of take the language and explore the ideas and the themes, but it's not about, no, you're this character, you're that character. I mean, that can happen, but rather giving voice to a lot of voices in a lot of interactive, exciting ways. And that that makes students um, claim the language rather than the role. Uh, and I think that's super powerful, super powerful. It, it's powerful for older kids too, but to start there I think is a wonderful, a particularly wonderful thing. Oh, that's yeah. such a good point. Thanks, Laura. Yeah, claiming the language instead of the role is really, that's profound. <laughs> well, it's Clayton, but yeah, it's good. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, brilliant. So an another question, uh, someone has said, recently an academic made a point about how only mentioning race when a black or biracial character in Shakespeare can disempower students of colour just as much as it might empower them. How can I open up discussion about whiteness through Shakespeare? Uh, yes, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, when I talk about using Shakespeare as a vehicle to, to, to talk about all of these things, whiteness is racialized, right? And so it's absolutely important to think about all of the ways that whiteness is constructed in Shakespeare's plays. And so even if you have, you know, because, you know, I'm used to being in diverse classrooms, but even if you're not in a diverse classroom and you just have, you know, a very homogenous group and say it's all white students, these are amazing texts to analyze the way that whiteness was made to be both neutral and beautiful in the Renaissance. And what does that mean for the legacies of us, to, for us today? And again, you could like bring in fashion magazine photos or allow students to kind of create Pinterest posts about like, what is beautiful today? And of course it is a moving thing, right? And I think that's also quite powerful to, to see how it is shifting. But yes, I think um, Shakespeare is a wonderful place to, to analyze whiteness. And I think the counter to also to universalism is the established but really important thing to think about, which is you would never expect, you know, a single black student to, oh, now please speak, tell us, tell us how it feels for you people to be that thing or whatever it is and whatever identity it is. And so the, the, the ability to, to interrogate language uh, whatever the setting is about, you know, trying to dig in deeper rather than to make quick stereotypical assumptions about, you know, oh, that's what that represents or whatever. It's, this is not the easy stuff, right? I mean, we want, we want it to be the rich discussions. So. Right. And I think one of the things Laura and I meant to um, talk about, and I forgot, I think it was my fault, um, that what, what we're requiring is a slower, mm -hmm lower approach to Shakespeare. And that if, you're, if your goal is just to march through the entire play, you should just t give them the plot and the character outlines. Like that's not the thing. The thing for us is the deep, rich analysis, which often requires a much slower approach and probably much less text to discuss
collectively. Yeah, and, that, and that's exactly, yeah. yeah, it's exactly where we are in this world of online learning, right? I mean, one, a, a fantastic teacher I've been working with here in Houston gets, gets to see his students 45 minutes twice a week right now. And there, <laughs> it's, not, so all the things that used to be about a rich extended conversations are gone. And so, and actually Folger's, Folger Library is being really good about this right now too, talking about what are the, what are the essential scenes? What are the things that you can get into, work closely with, and get rich dialogue going about knowing that it's not the whole play or it's not uh, you know, the sweeping arc of all the things that it could be. It's purposefully what you can do given the, the restrictions on time, which is even if you had them all the time is a really good idea. I mean, even yes. if it was back to pre-pandemic days. Yes. Focus is I, critical. Yes, yeah. yes. I wanna double down on that, right? Like that, that the deeper analysis is the the real takeaway like the plot of any given play or the characters and names of any given play should not be the thing that they walk away with that is too simple the kind of a way of untangling a, a rich metaphor the way that whiteness or blackness or a, ability is constructed in any of those scenes is more important than you know this kind of like I know the names of all the characters in Romeo and Juliet. Right. And I can match this quote. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or I can match this quote, yeah. <laughs> so, so I think that answers um, a question I, I was just gonna read out, but I, I'm gonna read it out anyway, because I've got another one to append to it. Um, so someone said, um, and would you say what matters more is how we read rather than what we read? Um, and I would also just ask, uh, do either of you have any recommendations um, for texts that you use to sort of speak back to Shakespeare or that you think work particularly well in conversation with Shakespeare, especially, you know, when we're sort of thinking about developing an anti-racist pedagogy? I've been, I mean, there, I, I, honestly, I just say most recently talking about act, uh, high school teaching, talking about using Toni Morrison's Desdemona with Othello, I think is powerful drama, complex text, beyond, I mean, way more than to cover in a class and yet so much, so much rich work is a, a recent thing we've been, I mean, here, as we were saying before we started, everyone's starting to focus on where will class go now? You know, the school year's about to start in the US, so people are thinking really ex excellent thoughts about planning that and August Wilson plays and other things. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's there's so many. Uh, um, so to circle back to the first question, um, I, I, I don't think that, like, so I'm happy teaching any Shakespeare play, because I do think that like, no matter what, it, they, they're still like incredibly rich texts, all of them. Um, and so I tr frequently try and swap out plays so that I get to teach different ones. And um, so, so I, I think that in terms of like what Shakespeare play you're gonna teach, it doesn't matter. Um, and, and I do think that what matters is the way you teach them to read and the way you allow them to engage their full sense of self with the text. Um, and that you say that that's what's expected is really important. Um, in terms of like pairing text, there are so, so many, um, but I will, yeah, I will echo the, August Wilson plays are really great in dialogue with Shakespeare and uh, Toni Morrison's Desdemona is fantastic. Janet Sears' Harlem Duets is great. I mean, there's a long list, so yeah. But I guess the other thing, I, I don't have a good sense of UK pedagogy around this right now. Um, uh, there's an enormous uh, movement in the US to do more and more with, um, with like a core text, but having lots and lots of, of student choice in additional readings. And often, especially for the, what is for us eighth and ninth grade, often with, for instance, Romeo and Juliet, that would mean uh, students selecting young adult lit books that they're reading as companion texts to, um, to a Shakespeare play. I've done some work on this. I have lots of opinions about how it could happen. But, um, but I think uh, that is where, um, where folks in the U.S. are trying to think about um, how do we engage student readers reading independently things that are easy for them to read so that when we have 
maximum time with the teacher to really focus on the difficult stuff where you need the where you need the extended um, look, but also we're having these external references. Oh, it's like the book you're reading. Oh, it's like this play we've looked at a part of or whatever. It enriches that dialogue by kind of spreading the borders uh, of what matters again and what can be brought in. Thank you. Um, and so another question reads, uh, if Zoom or I guess equivalent platforms uh, are now our primary site for learning about Shakespeare, are there things that you have noticed about the platform's tendency to perpetuate racist dynamics or its potential for anti-racist pedagogy? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I smell a dissertation or 17 right there, right? I mean, this is such a new world because it was so much, so many of these digital tools were auxiliary to classroom time. And now if they are classroom time, ever, so, much is, so much is different. So, so much has to be figured out. Um, I will say one group of students that, uh, high school students that I was, I was kind of sitting in on a friend's class in the spring, um, the school privacy policies were such that this was actually using Microsoft Teams for what it's worth but all the students had the option of being behind their little circle that was just their initials or otherwise a picture that they posted. And, and it was tough on the teacher, of course, to gain much sense of immediacy when you don't, you literally don't even have a face. And, you know, to know if someone's talking, you have to say, are you there? You know, you have to kind of individually call them out or whatever. So we have, we have a long way to go to understand how to both protect kids and give them the option of, of, of not showing off their house or their personal mess to the world or whatever, but at the same time, uh, thinking about what face, how faces matter, how your appearance on screen matters. We've, there's a lot of work to be done on that, I think. I think it's gonna be teachers figuring it out. More work for teachers, yeah. <laughs> um, thank you, okay, so, um, this, there's a, an interestingly kind of specific question here um, from a voice and text coach um, and she asks would you speak about your thoughts on how to engage with the language and iambic pentameter from different racial and cultural perspectives and identities in my experience the right in squares, scare quotes uh, the right way to speak these words in performance the prosody is very problematic very rigid prescriptive and prejudiced Amen. <laughs> so I, I completely agree. I think um, the recent public, uh, the public theater's radio production of Richard II, which had a black Richard II male, a black Bolingbroke female, um, and a very multicultural cast throughout, um, Proved and the the podcasts of the that radio play are available for free online. Um, you can link to the public theater and get it, or through uh, WNYC, which is the radio uh, station that produced it in the U.S. Um, I was asked. I'm part of what they call the. We, there are two academics who served as guides, and we sort of do the kind of humanity context around the production. And one of the things that I said was that it sounded so clear um, and so compelling because none of the actors employed RP, received pronunciation. And that the way that many actors are trained or students are trained to read Shakespeare is in this kind of, uh, kind of fakely neutralized British accent, even if they're Americans and it's just yes. horrible. <laughs> So to hear, yeah, exactly. To hear Black Americans with their Southern accents or their New York accents do this really hard play, Richard II. It's not one that's like normally taught in the U.S. I'm not sure about in the U.K., but it's not in the it's not in the top ten list of of plays that's produced. Um, to hear them use their normal accents and not to worry about stressing or unstressing, but just to kind of read it in a naturalistic way was so so um, uh, I think empowering for the listener because it sounded, it, it, was very, it was very easy to take in. Like it sounded like real dialogue. 
So it's just, it was really important. And I think that is what we should be telling all our students. You do not, and I have this in my, in my American college classroom. You ask the students to stand up 50% of the time. They'll like, like all of a sudden, like this weird British accent. I'm like, you're from Arizona. <laughs> so yes, right. allowing students to own the text with their own voices and to free it of some of these artificial structures is very, very important and part of the anti-racist work that we all need to be doing now. I'm conscious that I'm not going to be able to pose all of the questions that have been asked here to you. So I'm, I'm going to ask one which I think speaks to concerns that a number of different people have. Um, so, so one person has said that I feel that teachers of colour will have a different experience at the start of term than white teachers in addressing both the pandemic and racism. From your own experience, Ayanna, what advice do you give to black indigenous uh, persons of colour uh, teachers in Shakespeare studies? Laura, same question, what advice do you give to white teachers in Shakespeare studies? Do we have skin in the game? <laughs> do we have skin in the game? I love it. Yes, white skin. <laughs> well, I do um, make a point of making it explicit to my students that I know I'm a black woman teaching a Shakespeare class because um, I did have an experience early in my career where I didn't say anything about my own position in in terms of the pedagogy or the things we were going through until the end of the semester. And a student came up to me at the end and said, I don't think of you as black though. And I, I was like, but what, you say that as if that would be an insult. I'm so proud of being black. And I think of it as a, you know, a wonderful asset that I bring to Shakespeare to everything. Um, and so now I, I have since that moment, which again was early in my career, uh, in, in one of the first days of, of teaching, I'll say, I know you weren't expecting a black woman to be your Shakespeare professor, but let's think about why this is an added benefit, <laughs> right? Because I bring post-colonial theory, African-American studies, critical race theory, all of these things that make the reading of Shakespeare that much more rich, um, as opposed to if I only had, you know, some, some you know, model of universalism, um, which I think, again, as I said, the students will smell a lie in it instantly and then check out. Yeah, I think that ownership of who you are, you know, and I, I mean, there are enough generations now between uh, me and the teacher, future teachers I'm working with that it's like, I have to tell you, here's, here's the truth of how I am and where this comes from and when I first heard this stuff and how I've taught it, not so much Back in the day, I taught it this way, but here's, you know, if I'm thinking about teaching this now, here's who I am and what I have to account for. And I, I think it, uh, all of the Gen Z research that's all, already coming out of all the ways that we know these re um, learners is, is that if you ignore who people are and assume and make assumptions about, oh, we're all together, this is some place where the real world doesn't interfere, then you, you definitely make yourself irrelevant and all the other all the other voices are going to be much more powerful than than your own I'm, I'm, I'm wary of keeping you here all afternoon because I think that we could very easily do that. So um, I'll, I'll ask just one more question if that's okay with the two of you. Um, so um, one question reads, if we're talking about inclusivity and accessibility, do we as teachers also need to think about discomfort with teaching online as partly resting on ableist assumptions where teachers and students must be able to see and hear each other for proper, again in scare quotes, uh, proper learning to take place? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. It's a big, it's going to be a yes. big problem. And, and one that, you know, I, <laughs> one that at least has not been addressed sufficiently in the schools that my children are attending. So. Um, yes, obviously, closed captioning, um, other, other techniques that we can use online are important uh, and important for all the webinars that, that we do in the future. Um, <laughs> I'll put in a plug for this, Jill, in the future. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that we do need to make sure that we're trying to make the online space, even though it is actually an ableist space, if we can try and acknowledge that we are aware of the ways that it is ableist is very important. And again, I think goes back to Laura's excellent point before 
about if you are not acknowledging both your place, the platform's place, and your student's place in terms of identity and learning, you have already lost them. You've lost them because whatever they're doing on their own and in their own affinity groups will be more important and more relevant for their lives. And those may not be the places where they learn how to deal with complex texts, as Laura said before. <laughs> like we actually have things that we have to teach them. They do need some of the things that we're offering them, but we have to be able to offer it in a way that they can hear it. <laughs> Literally, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both so much. I mean, that's just been absolutely incredible and a, a just a fantastically rich and inspiring discussion. So thank you for that. Um, I'm going to apologize uh, to all the people who posted questions that we haven't had time to get through. I'm going to make a note of them all, though, to, uh, as I sort of think about topics for future sessions. So hopefully at some point um, your, your questions will get addressed. Um, so obviously today's session is um, part of an ongoing conversation that we need to keep having as, as scholars and teachers. Um, but thanks to everybody who's joined in today. Uh, thank you for coming along. Thank you for asking your uh, fantastic questions. Uh, I said at the beginning of this session that one of the goals of this series is to help us kind of collaborate and share materials. So with that in mind, what I, what I like to do usually at the end of these uh, sessions is to kind of put together uh, as Ayanna nicely put it earlier, a kind of crowdsourced document um, of resources. So I, I will put together a list of um, resources that will be helpful for anti-racist approaches to pedagogy. I am not going to claim that that will be exhaustive, so please do not think that, <laughs> that that's what this is. Um, but I can include things like the fantastic Folger Critical uh, Race Conversations. If you've got ideas for things you think I should include, if you could email me uh, before this time next week when I'll be sending the list out, that would be really brilliant um, and also if you've got any ideas for other themes we could cover in these conversations in the future I'd really love to hear them because I'm hoping to have a few more of these in the autumn uh, because as I said I think well I for one really need to um, find out what other people are doing at the moment as teaching has just completely changed um, so thank you all once again and um, for now, what I really want to do is just say a huge thank you uh, once more to Ayanna Thompson and Laura Turchi for that just fabulous and generous discussion. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you, Jill. Thanks. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah.